need to establish a relationship between internal energy and volume or internal um, or volume internal energy and temperature like how what kind of experiment do we need so the heat capacity is a straightforward measurement we could imagine it tells us the partial derivative of internal energy versus temperature right so here while we're talking about the Joe Thompson experiment we're trying to set up environment where the internal energy or the enthalpy are set um, to be like constant throughout the process so that we can have like a partial derivative of say partial derivative of V over T at constant U, right? And taking together with the um, heat capacity and also the, it gives us an expression of internal pressure and so on. So these are the three partial derivatives interconnected with each other. And the whole point of setting up the draw experiment is to have a um, process along which the internal energy is kept constant. So we can bring internal energy in to our calculus, to our um, transformation between these properties. All right, so before we get started, I just want to highlight a little bit in why do we want to do it, and then let's look at how do we do it. So we'll start from the Joule experiment. Um, so this one, the setup here is pretty straightforward. Um, on the left-hand side, imagine we have some kind of gas. And then these two are containers or space that's covered by rigid adiabatic wall. So remember, whenever we see an adiabatic wall, it tells us about the heat between system, heat transfer between the system and surrounding to be zero. So whenever you see an adiabatic wall, we can instantaneously write Q equals to zero. And on the right-hand side, in cylinder B, we can say here we have vacuum. All right. So in the draw experiment, what do we have is let's allow the gas to flow through a valve into vacuum or expand into vacuum. Now in this process, we have a thermometer in there measuring the temperature change of this adiabatic expansion of gas into vacuum. Right. So what exactly is happening in the process? Now, as we know, using the first law of thermodynamics for any closed system, we have delta U equals to Q plus W. Right. So Q is the heat transfer work is the, the work that's being done by the system to the surrounding. In this process, we have Q equals to zero. That is known just because we have the adiabatic wall. Yes. Now, everything like inside the adiabatic wall is considered the system. All right. So in this process, we have Q equals to zero. So that's talking about there's no heat transfer. And what about work? So this one is a um, irreversible. So this one, you would like thinking about plugging like W equals to negative um, P PDV. But in this process, it's not applicable for reasons that this process is not reversible, right? So the gas, once it goes into the vacuum, there's no reason it's going to come back and regenerate into um, your cylinder A. So this process is irreversible. But if we're thinking about what exactly is going on, right? When we're talking about gas doing work on the surrounding, now because my A and B are both part of my system and B is just a vacuum, we're not exerting any additional pressure on the rigid wall, right? So the, 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 the whole overall rigid wall is not changing. So in this process, work also equals to zero. Or in this setup, we have a iso energy or iso internal energy process. All right, so that's, yes. Right, but it's not doing any work. Now, the, 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 the wall themselves are rigid, so the wall is not moving. 
So our system is not doing work on the system. All right. So by setting up the drawer experiments, scientists has a relatively straightforward way to say, hey, this process is a process in which the internal energy is kept constant. So in this process, since we have a thermometer here, and we have a way to measure the change of the volume by just looking, by just um, alternating, like or measuring how much gas is passing through that valve. So in this process, we can define the draw coefficient that is something that can be experimentally measured in this setup, right? So we're measuring the change of temperature with respect to volume at constant internal energy. All right, so this whole setup is to tell you, hey, this is something we can experimentally measure. It's like our uh, voice law or Charles law. It is straightforward to keep your pressure as constant or keep your volume as constant and doing the subsequent measurement. So the draw experiment gives us a setup where we're kept, um, where we're in which we're keeping the internal energy as a constant and we're measuring the relative change um, between your temperature and volume in this setup. All right. And as we were saying, our draw coefficient is internally connected to internal pressure and also our heat capacity using the chain rule. So instead of like, for example, in the state of uh, equation of state, we have PV and T. So those are the three coefficients or variables. Now we have similarly three variables, but they are internal energy, temperature, and volume, right? So these three properties are interconnected with each other. And the relationship we have, we can write out, well, first of all, for any prop, uh, relationship, well, for whenever we have three variables, we can always write out this chain rule to be like dt over du at constant v times du over dv at constant t and dv over dt at constant u equals to negative one. So we have a way to write the relative relationship between my internal pressure, draw coefficient, and also my heat capacity. Now in here, for example, if we're focusing on the internal pressure, we can have, well, du over dv at constant t equals to negative du over dt at constant v comes to here, like this one goes on the right and then we flip that partial derivative, times this dt over dv at constant u. Likewise, this one goes to the right and then we flip it. All right. And what exactly are these? Now, du over dt at constant v is our heat capacity, the isochoric heat capacity. And then my dt over dv at constant u, that's our draw coefficient. All right. So this is the internal energy. Again, what we're trying to say here is by carefully designing the experiment, we have a way to say, we're manually keep the internal energy as a constant, and we're getting the relationship of volume and temperature at constant internal energy. Okay. Next one. We're moving on from internal energy to enthalpy. So this one is the modified version of the draw experiment. So in the draw experiment, we're trying to keep internal energy as a constant. Alternatively, in the draw thompson experiment, we're trying to keep enthalpy as a constant. Now, instead of having a relationship um, between U, T, and V for enthalpy, we're looking for a relationship between U, T, and pressure. 
So let's see what's the setup of this experiment and how does this experiment leads to a iso um, enthalpy. I actually don't, I forgot about that word, but the process where enthalpy is kept constant. Okay, so if we're looking at this one, on the left-hand side, imagine this is our initial state. And here we have a solid, uh, we have like a, a porous plug in the middle that allows gas to slowly pass through from the chamber whenever they are connected. And on the left and on the right, so these are moving uh, walls that are rigid and adiabatic. And on the top and bottom, they are also rigid and adiabatic wall that creates this chamber. Now in here, on the left hand side, we start from a chamber of gas with like P1, V1, and T1. And eventually by moving this plug, we're doing work on the gas in the left chamber. But when the gas is passing through, we have um, the, the, the gas start to build up in your right chamber. And then when keep pushing the left plug, the, ch the gas will start to do work on the right plug. All right. Okay, so in this process, you can just imagine on both ends, we have pressure applied on the moving wall. But my P1 is smaller, or my P2 is smaller than P1. So eventually, giving it enough time will slowly move all the gas um, to the right chamber. All right, and in this process, keep in mind, we're, we're having this porous uh, separate in the middle that is like um, only allow gas to slowly go by. So we are having reversible processes along the way. So how exactly do we analyze it and why we say the Joel Thompson experiment have a constant enthalpy in the process? So we can quickly use our derivation here. So first of all, thinking about what's being done, now we have reversible work that's being done, the equation we can use is that the reversible equals C negative PDD. Right. So if we look at the left chamber or the left pistol, always does work on the system, or in this case, let's say we have gas. <coughs> Or we can say W left equals to negative. Well, initial uh, volume on the left is V1. Final volume on the left is zero. And we have P1 EV. All right. Now, pressure is kept constant in this process. It's an external pressure we exert on the piston. So we can take that P1 out to be negative P1 times zero minus V1 equals to P1 V1. So that's the amount of work our left piston is done on the system. Likewise, if we look at the right, so the system does work on the right. So similarly, let's apply our W equals to negative PDD. So W right equals to um, the integral of final mass over initial. So V2 to zero, P2 dV, we get negative P2 V2 minus zero gives you P2. Right. And if you think about it, the sign uh, negative 
the sign actually makes sense. So the, the left piston does work on the system. So the work is done by the surrounding on the system. The work left is a positive value. And the system is doing work on the right piston, and that's, that's a negative value. So overall, we got our total work equals to work left plus work right. And that gives us to be, well, P1, V1 minus P2, V2. All right, and then we're ready to use our first law of thermodynamics. Now, what is in our first law of thermodynamics? Delta U, or the change of internal energy, equals to U2 minus U1. So this two and one are referring to the final state and initial state, right? So that's our final state, that's our initial state, equals to Q plus W. Now my entire system is always surrounded by adiabatic wall, so Q equals to zero. Again, adiabatic, which equals to P1, wait, V1 minus PT. E2. All right, and now we can move terms, and then it becomes obvious. We'll move all the final state with final state, or two with two, one with one. We get u2 plus p2v2 equals to p1v1 plus u1. And by the definition of enthalpy, my h always equals to u plus pv we got H2 equals to H1. Or we say the change of enthalpy is zero. All right. So some of the question we might be asking is giving you a set of the experiments and tell you that in this experiment, one of the state function is kept constant throughout the process. Can you derive and find out like why that is the case or prove why it is true? It's the, just a demonstration in how that's being done. And again, like why do we care about it? We want to make a link between my enthalpy and pressure. That's something we can measure. So in this case, we are defining our Joe Thompson experiment, which is mu j t. Again, you can measure the temperature while we are changing the pressure or alternating the pressure on both ends of, um, of my piston to get a relationship between temperature and pressure at constant enthalpy. All right. So again, a quick question here. Is my Joe Thompson uh, coefficient an intensive or extensive property? Okay, um, why it is intensive? Because I feel like temperature and pressure are both intensive. Right, so it must be intensive, right? So that's, it. that's the right way of thinking. And also, if we think about the experimental setting, it doesn't matter how much gas we put in there. Right. We do it with a smaller um, chamber, we do it with a larger chamber, well, the enthalpy is always co kept constant just because of the setup. All right, see if we have any questions before we dive into a little bit, well, significant amount of math. <laughs> So let's look at a bit more math and work on this problem together. So this is one of your chapter end problem. First question asks you to derive um, equation 2.65, which is, well, ask you to derive delta um, the dH over dP at constant T equals to negative Cp mu j T. So this is like what we did before, like with the Joule experiment. 
And the second part is more complicated. This one is trying to make a link between our Joe Thompson experiment um, and the draw experiment using the equation of state. Right, so if we think about the internal energy depends on volume and temperature, enthalpy depends on temperature and pressure. Right, so somehow my volume, temperature, and pressure are connected using equation of state. Or in this case, we have like um, chi that's telling us that's, that's part of the equation of state we, we are talking about, or the partial derivative we're talking about. So how exactly can we write it out as an expression of mu j t with these terms? The first one is pretty straightforward. The second one is more challenging. We'll work on it together. So I'm just going to keep this page open. So these are the things you will need. Um, on, top of the, on top of the equation provided, you might also need to use some calculus um, well, strategy, strategies that we discussed. So let's start working on it. So the first question is the more straightforward one, like we just discussed, like um, when we're deriving that relationship between internal pressure, draw constant, and the uh, DC capacity, the I2 car capacity. So here we're talking about a similar uh, situation, right? So what we have is a relationship between enthalpy, pressure, and temperature. So effectively, what we are measuring or what we are trying to prove is using the chain rule to show that this relationship is true. So there are two different ways you can do it. You can start from the chain rule and then go backwards. It's like, okay, so we have the chain rule. So my dH over dP at constant T must equal to these two terms. And these two terms are by definition my CP and mu JT. Or you can do like what I did, right? So just plug in uh, CP and mu JT and then find out, okay, so this is effectively a, another expression. We're just moving terms of the chain rule. This should give you the same answer. And that's one of the nice things about this class. You can always check your result by doing it in a different way. And that's the first part. We're doing fine on the first part, I hope. Okay, second part, the more challenging one. I'll erase these because we will be using this top equation here, so I'm going to leave it there. So 
for the second part, um, it looks very complicated and frightening, but it gives you a hint. You say like start taking the partial derivative of pressure, constant P, of enthalpy. So let's just write it out what we have here. Uh, first of all, of all, we're trying to prove mu j p equals to negative v over c p times pi c v mu j minus pi p plus mos. So that's what we want. And the question tells us start taking d h over dp at constant t. And again, we know dh over dp at constant t equals to negative cp mu jp. Right. So, that's why we know that equals to negative um, cp mu jp from part a. So let's do that together. So this one, we know that h equals to u plus pv. That's by definition true. So write it out as du over dp at constant t plus p dv over dp at constant t and v times dp over dp at constant t. So this one just using h equals to u plus um, pv, or just taking a derivative of like, derivative of the product of um, pv equals to pdv plus vdp. So two things has been used. h equals to u plus pv, and then d pv equals to pdv plus So some of the things cancel out, like obviously these two dp terms cancel out. And uh, that's about it. So we end up with an expression of du over dp at constant t plus p dv over dp at constant t plus v. And this term will equal to our negative CP mu JP. All right, so we're getting very close because if we look at what we're looking after here by moving the CP term and also the negative to the left hand side, so we have our negative CP mu JT. So this one will then become negative CP UGT equals to um, chi V CV UJ and minus chi VP plus V. All right, so these two are just simply moving terms together. So now on the left hand side, this one is set. We already have our left hand side, uh, side set. Our volume, this part is also set, right? And if we look at this center part, now by definition, our chi, let's see, our chi is given by its definition equals to one, negative one over P, V times dV over dP. 1 over v times dv over dp at constant t. So this term is also set because we have negative kv equals to dv over dp at constant t by just looking at the definition of our isothermal compressibility. All right, so this one, just say like this one equals to negative kv, so this term, negative kvp, is also set. With me so far? Uh, we didn't use much, right? We're just using the definition of each of these terms and replacing them with the partial derivative expression. 
I'm going to pause here and see if we have any questions. No? OK. So then our question just simply becomes, we're trying to prove that the partial derivative of u over p at constant t equals to this term, the volume times isothermal compressibility chi times Cd times u shape. So let's just use the definition of each of the terms and write it out and see what do we have. Now volume stays as volume. Chi, that's negative 1 over V times dV over dP at constant T. CV, that's dU over dT at constant V, and our mu j is dt over dv at constant u. Right, this one just writing out what each term is as a partial derivative. And then what do we have? Now the volume and volume cancel out. We have this term effectively equals to the uh, negative of dv over dp at constant t times du over dt at constant v and dt over dv at constant u. So whenever we say, like, we see that we have u, t, and v, we have u, t, and v in different positions, this is a hint telling us to use the chain rule. Because we have, again, three variables interconnected with each other. All right, so by using the chain rule, what do we have? We have, well, du over dt at constant v, dt over dv at constant u times dv over du at constant t equals to negative 1. Or if we write it, up, write it out, we have the relationship as du over dv at constant t, which is the slugs term here, that equals to, or to put the negative on there, negative of dt over, um, wait, this one is du on the top, so we're looking for du over dv. So sorry. let me just leave this du over dt here. du over dt at constant v, dt over dv as constant u. Just moving this term to the right, we have the dv over du at constant t and to the negative, wait, dv over, du over dv. Sorry. Um, I'm just moving this one to the right and then flip the du over dv, that's all. So by using the chain rule, we get an expression of these product of the partial derivative to be equal to du over dv at constant t. And a negative in the front about it. All right. And now, in this case, both of these two partial derivatives have t as a constant, so we can play around with the terms in these partial derivatives, and my dv will cancel out. My negative will cancel out. And what we have? Now, after canceling out those two terms, we get du over dp at constant t. And that's what we're looking for. Again, okay, we can only do this because both of these partial derivatives are at constant temperature. 
also have the annotated version uploaded um, in our course website. So in this whole process, we didn't use any calculus more complicated than the chain rule or just the definition of the terms and just moving things around. It looks horrible, I know, but um, if you go, at, go by it like one by one, you'll find out by just writing out the expression of the terms that we're using or the definition of the terms we're using, it's not too bad. See if we have any questions before we move on. Nope. Okay. Next one. Now we're moving on to our lecture six which is, again, more applications of the first law of thermodynamics. I think these are just like, instead of writing things on paper and do the derivation, let's have specific scenarios and see how can we use the first law of thermodynamics to calculate properties that we want, like work, delta U, or heat. So getting started, by looking at the first law and the, um, their relationship with a perfect gas. So this one should be a, or, or ideal gas. Now your textbooks say like perfect gas and ideal gas um, are effectively the same after we discuss statistical mechanics, but they are the same. We're just gonna say that perfect gas are ideal gas for now. So whenever we have perfect gas, we're saying like PV equals NRT. And as we were saying, we say the internal energy of the perfect gas is only dependent on temperature. Or you will all sometimes see us write it as like U as a function of T for perfect gas. Or effectively, when we're writing the heat capacities of the perfect gas, those partial derivatives now becomes normal derivatives. So here we're going to do a very quick derivation to find out the relationship of CP and CV for ideal gases, like what we did before. We'll compare our results together. So using the definition of the heat capacity, we have CV equals to du over dt at constant v. Since my, um, my u is not dependent on v for perfect gases, it then becomes a normal derivative du over dt for perfect gas. Or the other way to put it is that for perfect gas, we can write du equals to cv dt. And then for um, the isobaric heat capacity, Likewise, we have CP equals to dH over dT at constant P, but enthalpy is also independent from pressure for perfect gas only, so we can rewrite it as dH over dT for perfect gas. Or we have dH equals to CP dT. All right. And then simply using the definition of enthalpy, we can derive the relationship between CP and CV for perfect gas only. So what do we have? We have CP minus CV equals to dH over dT minus du over dT. And my H equals to U plus PV this gives us, well, du over dt plus d nRT over t, and also like PV equals nRT for perfect gases, minus du over dt. And we get the difference between your CV and CP for perfect gases are just nR. So that's the same result as we get in our previous derivation using the more general expression 
of the um, heat capacity. Right? Yes. This one? Yeah. We're talking about the difference between CP and CV, okay. right? So CV is by definition DU over DT. I'm just using the definition of CV here. Okay. All right. So next up, in general, when we're applying the first law of thermodynamics, again, what we have is stating the internal energy of an isolated system is conserved and our du equals to dq plus dw, right? So that's the infinitesimal change of internal energy, infinitesimal change of heat transfer, infinitesimal change of work. There are several things we can, we can put in addition to the first law of thermodynamics. Like for example, we know that for ideal gas, we have du equals to CV dt. And for reversible processes, we have dw equals to negative PdV. But keep in mind is that these are only true for reversible processes involving ideal gases, right? So whenever you have du equals to CV dt, keep in mind you can only use it if we specify it being an ideal gas. And this one, the dw reversible equals negative PdV, we can only use it if we specify it as a reversible process. Now, in, in our discussion worksheet and also in our test, we'll make sure we specified it unless, um, so we'll make sure we specify like reversible or not, ideal gas or not in our question. If we did not say it is an ideal gas, do not make that assumption, all right? And in that case, if we have both of these terms to be true, we end up having the expression as CV dt equals to dq minus PdV. And let's look at an example question together. I don't have time to finish it, but we, I'm just going to do one step out of the four. And you can finish um, the rest of the cycle yourself and compare your answer with our annotated notes. So next one is example 2.4. So this one is a, well, a pretty straightforward question in what kind of equation to use. We start by reading the problem. Say we have 0.1 more of a perfect gas. And it's given us the perfect gas have the molar isochoric heat capacity as 1.50 R. And it also tells us our CV in this situation is independent of temperature. Right, so my CV is just a constant. It's no longer a temperature dependent property because it's given in the problem. And it's telling us this reversible gas undergoes, an rever um, this perfect gas <laughs> undergoes a reversible cyclic process. So on this PV diagram, it's showing like it's going from one to two to three to four to one. So that's a cyclic process. So in this problem, it's asking us to calculate heat, work, and delta U for each step and also for the complete cycle. So to set up this problem, first of all, when reading it, we can write out what are the things we know. Like for example, we know it is a perfect gas and hence we can write out relationship like PV equals NRT and instead of, um, well, on top of the isochoric heat capacity, we also have the isobaric heat capacity because we know the relationship between CP and CV for ideal gases, right? We did that derivation two times in this class. And then for reversible process, 
we have we can use our DW equals to negative PDV for reversible processes. And for cyclic processes, our total internal energy change must add up to be zero. All right. So a few things. And then we look at our first step, which is between state one to state two. Then for state one to state two, we see that this is isochoric or my V1 equals to V2 equals to 1,000 centimeter cube. So for isochoric processes, we should be using our CV, which equals to 1.50 R CVM, the molar um, volume heat capacity. And we have our initial pressure, P1 equals to 1 ATM, P2 equals to 3 ATM. So since my volume is kept the same for this reversible PV work, my W reversible for 1 to 2 will just equal to 0 since it is isochoric. My delta V is 0. And then we just need heat or internal energy, right? So they are effectively the same. But in this case, what we have is, well, Q1 equals to T1 to T2 CV dt. And in this case, we have our CV equals to 1.5 NR. And we're just talking about the temperature change T2 minus T1. We do not have temperature on the diagram, but since we have the ideal gas law, we can solve it using the pressure and volume. So then it becomes 1.50 times P2V2 divided by an R minus P1V1 divided by an R. I have an R left. And then it's just plugging numbers and solve for the for the number. And likewise, we can do the same for the rest of the process. And as a sanity check, which is a nice thing, after you do the pro the delta U calculation for one, two, three, four, the four steps, you can add it up and to double check to make sure your delta U ends up to be zero because it is a cyclic process, right? So the delta U of one, two, three, four step adding up together must equal to zero. So try to yourself. Um, it's not complicated. There are multiple ways to solve it. And well, you can compare your answer with either do the delta U equals to zero or you can compare it with our annotated notes. But before we leave, I want you to think about this process. If we have an isothermal process saying the temperature is kept the same, how do we calculate or what exactly is the expression of heat transfer for an isothermal process? Is it going to be zero? Is it going to be positive, negative for an isothermal expansion? We'll go over that next Monday. And um, if you have the blank lecture note, just keep it. We'll keep using it in our Monday lecture. All right. Have a good weekend.